My name is Marisa Fernandez, and I am a research analyst here at CIDOTI. The format of the webcast today will be a 20-minute presentation by management, followed by Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, and I'll ask it for you. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ryan Melser, CEO and CTO. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. It's great to be here. You may take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Like Marissa mentioned, I'm the, the CEO and CTO of American Technology Company, American Battery Technology. So we are a publicly traded company. We are currently listed on the over-the-counter exchange. We have submitted an application to move up to the NASDAQ listing that is currently under review. We have three different business units as a company. So we have developed an integrated processing system for the recycling of lithium ion batteries. We're able to take in still charged and still assembled electric vehicle and stationary storage and consumer electronics based batteries, go through a, a mechanical processing a physical separation, and then a chemical separation process to recover each of the main battery metals that are required to go back into the cap of manufacturing markets and several different byproducts that we also sell back into the industry. We are currently building our first pre-commercial facility for this battery recycling operation in Northern Nevada. So this facility will have a, a 20,000 metric ton per year feed rate that we are planning to have operational by mid next year. Separately, we own large amounts of land and mining claims in central and northern Nevada. And we've developed in-house technologies for new mechanisms from extracting lithium and nickel and cobalt from these types of resources, purifying these metals up to the battery cathode grade quality, and then selling those back into the market in a closed loop. So the products out of this primary metals business are near identical to the products of our battery recycling system. And each of those help contribute to the large void in the supply of these battery metals within the domestic US. And then separately, we also own large amounts of these land and mining claims. And we have a different business unit for actually maintaining and operating these different pieces of land that we own. So this is an extremely fast growing market, the demand for battery metals domestically in the US and globally. We've been fortunate enough to win a handful of private corporate awards and government contracts over the past few years that we'll talk about in detail. And we're excited about the team that we've been able to bring on here over the past year to really help scale up our operations as we move into commercial scale manufacturing and operations. Nobody really needs to be convinced that there is a dramatic growth in the demand for electric vehicles, both in the US and abroad. And that directly relates to a dramatic increase in demand for these types of battery metals. So these lithium and cobalt and nickel and manganese and copper products, their demands are growing extremely quickly. And as we've seen over the past you know, six to nine months, extreme increases in their commodity prices as well as that demand and supply imbalance keeps growing. But unfortunately, the US really isn't a player in this game. For each of those metals, for lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, less than 1% of global manufacturing capacity of each is in the US. So while we see these very large electric vehicle manufacturing plants go up in the US, these very large cell manufacturing plants in the US, they still have to source almost the entirety of their battery metal supply chain abroad. This in results in increased costs for them through the increased logistics and transportation and tariffs. It's increased environmental impact through those long transport distances. And also because they have less control over how those battery metals are actually produced abroad. And then maybe most importantly is that it provides a security of supply risk, both for the corporations and for the US government itself. As we've seen over the past two years in these lockdowns, any industry that is dependent almost entirely on foreign source components is vulnerable. And increasing the domestic production of these battery metals helps enable these 
battery companies to be much more self-sustained within the US itself. There's both the carrot and the stick approach. You know, many different governments are imposing regulations essentially to force companies to recycle, to force recycled content to be in the US and to penalize companies who don't do so. But there's also the carrot side, many different types of incentives government agencies are putting in place. So large amounts of grants, more for the R&D and demonstration scale level, of which we've already won a few. And then very large amounts of near zero interest loans that are available for the scale up and commercialization of these technologies. The Department of Energy through their loan program office specifically has over $17 billion in low interest loans they're trying to deploy right now. And one of their major areas of interest is domestic critical materials production. For recycling, we're fortunate that this is really showing the amount of batteries being put into the market. And as there's this huge amount of manufacturing and material being put into the field, this is essentially feedstock that will come back to the recycling market at some point. There will be different timelines for when different material comes back, but by having this large vested amount of material going into the market, into the field provides a large amount of prospective material to come back into the recycling industry at some point. The issue right now, though, is that there really isn't a closed loop either globally or within the US itself. Once this material gets to end of life, there aren't great options for how this material can be processed in a manner that is economically sustainable, that is environmentally low impact and that actually reintroduces the extracted metals back into this closed loop supply chain. And that's really because these batteries really aren't seen as a resource yet. Many companies see these as a waste, as a liability, as something to just get rid of. And that's the case because many of the existing recycling processes aren't able to recover value from these materials in large enough quantity to really satisfy their own costs. And as a result, many companies today need to be paid to take in material, similar to a tipping fee at a landfill, in order to operate even near being economically sustainable. And because there's this fee to process material, it's a disincentive for material to be returned back into the market. But the background of myself and much of the team we brought on here over the past year really comes from the battery manufacturing side. So we were some of the initial engineers who designed the Tesla Panasonic Gigafactory in Northern Nevada, helping design the physical building itself, the cell manufacturing layouts, the utility systems, the environmental controls per room. And in these types of cell manufacturing facilities, what is really received are these types of highly refined metal powders, liquid materials, solid materials that are then fed through powders being converted into slurries, slurries into coated systems, into dried systems, into rolls, into cells, into modules, into packs. And at each one of those stages, there are defects, there are material yield losses, especially in the early stages of factories as they're going through first time commissioning. So we have spent years uh, in depth really working to refine these different types of operations and to help really bring these to market and reduce these different types of defects at each one of those stages. So as we now are developing a recycling process, instead of just taking a brute force method and simply melting the entire battery or grinding the entire battery, we're using many of the same techniques that we developed in the manufacturing side to essentially demanufacture these batteries, to back out many of those operations and essentially force these components to fail and to separate in a very strategic process, which allows us to separate cells from modules, subcell components from each other, to separate those individual layers that are within the subcell components, and then to sort them in an efficient manner. Once we have large amounts of those lower value materials removed and sold as byproducts, we then have a very targeted hydrometallurgy train where we're able to extract each of those elements one at a time, purify them to the battery cathode specifications required by cathode refiners, and then to sell them back into the market to enable closed loop operations. 
And this really differentiates from what a handful of other companies are doing out there today. You know, large amounts do that simply melt everything together approach where you end up having large amounts of pollutants formed on the air emission side, on the liquid water discharge side. And you really end up mixing together all of the high value components with the low value components. And then it makes it much more difficult in subsequent steps to extract those high value materials, to purify them to the specifications required and to sell them back into the battery market as opposed to simply downcycling them and selling them to the, the metal alloy market. The companies that really go for the simplified, you know, grind the whole material together, they don't have the high temperature operations. So there aren't the same concerns as far as the air emissions, but it still is a relatively low strategic approach and makes it uh, require for a, a complex hydrometallurgy training in the back end, really having to separate out all those contaminants from the metals of value. So what we do is this demanufacturing approach that removes large amounts of these low value materials up front by backing out many of those manufacturing steps and then having that target approach to be able to get very high recovery ratios with high metal purities and with low operating costs that don't require all the same level of chemical impurity removal systems. So what this then does is allow us to create this closed loop and close that back end, both for end of life material that we receive back from the market and also waste and defects from each of the three other stages we were able to feed back into our recycling system. And then at the bottom right, as we see, we also have our primary metal business where we take these virgin resources, we're able to extract those individual elements and we also sell those back into the market. So coming out, we have those chemically indistinguishable components that are sold back to the same chemical refiners these cathode manufacturers to then use these lithium and nickel and cobalt and manganese products to manufacture brand new cathode to close that chain. We're excited that we have been working with, you know, one of the largest chemical companies in the world. So about two years ago, BSF hosted a global competition to identify the most promising lithium ion battery recycling technologies in the world. They said any company who had a promising technology, they would bring into their in-house accelerator incubator program hosted by Greentown Labs in Boston. They would provide um, initial cash funds. They would provide access to all of BSF development facilities. And they would essentially be a vetting period where the startup and BSF would work together to decide how best to move forward together. So throughout 2019, they said over 100 companies applied to this competition. And that fall, they selected us as the only winner of the battery recycling portion of that circularity challenge. So it's been a great experience working with them over the past two years, both on a strategic front and also the fact that they are one of the largest customers of these battery metal products that we make within North America. So we have two different development facilities. We work out of Greentown Labs near Boston, Massachusetts. And we also have our own facility, our private laboratory in Reno. So we're able to run our bench scale operations to actually generate bench quantities of each of those four cathode grade products you see there. We're able to send these to prospective companies and customers to show that we actually meet the purity specifications required, as well as any morphology specs that they need and we're now working to actually have these battery metal products be synthesized into new active cathode material to be tested against otherwise identical virgin source cathode material to take the next step in this qualification process. Separately from our recycling division, we also have this primary metals group. Because even with a perfect battery recycling system, one that would get 100% recovery rate, as the occupied mass of batteries in the field grows, as the amount of electric vehicles in the field actually grows, you still need additional material to be put into this closed loop chain in order to meet all that demand. So we see it as essential to have both the recycling business and the primary metal business to be able to meet these global metal demands. We own, like I mentioned, large amounts of 
of land and mining claims in central Nevada. About a year ago, we started working on developing a new type of mechanism for how we could actually extract lithium from these really unique types of resources that are found in central Nevada. These are relatively low starting concentration of lithium compared to other resources throughout the world. But the lithium is really held in a different type of, of host structure within these lattice materials. And if you apply conventional process flow sheets, it generally is not economical to produce lithium from these types of materials. But instead of applying existing flow sheets, we've worked at our development centers over the past year to, to really bring to market new first of kind mechanisms for how to liberate lithium from these specific type of resources that we have here in Nevada. And by doing so, we've really been able to start from the beginning, develop a new type of process that really does not overlap very much at all with current technologies. And has allowed us to actually produce these bench samples of lithium hydroxide that meet battery cathode specifications and to do so with types of equipment and operating costs that actually make it very attractive compared to what is in the market today. So doing this bench scale development last year, we were able to partner with DuPont and American Lithium to submit for grant funding to the US Department of Energy through their advanced manufacturing office. And in the second half of last year, we went through over six months worth of technology assessments and validations and reviews. And at the start of this year, we were awarded a grant from the Department of Energy through their critical materials program. This four and a half million dollar project is really meant to take our bench scale work and to now scale it up by orders of magnitude and to construct and operate a five metric ton per day system down in central Nevada to actually prove out this technology in an integrated fashion at this field demonstration scale. So we're going through this project now, constructing this mobile facility that will be deployed down in central Nevada, and then actually be operating it during these rigorous trials to generate this lithium hydroxide material and to perform the assessments as part of this project. There are a handful of other companies really trying to move forward with these types of battery recycling and battery metal production systems. We really see that we have two advantages compared to many other companies out there. The first is the, the demanufacturing approach for the recycling system. It provides a, a very low capex per throughput upfront system that allows us to extract many byproducts upfront that would be contaminants if allowed to pass to the back end hydrometallurgy system. And by doing so, we're able to have a much more targeted chemical extraction train that dramatically reduces the operating costs of this type of facility while allowing us to also have high recovery ratios and return those materials back to the market in a closed loop. And secondly, having both this recycling technology and our primary battery metal system under one roof really provides a lot of synergies. While the front ends of these processes are very different, the recycling versus the primary metals, once we get into the leach liquor purifications, the conversion and crystallization processes, the quality control, the sales channels, there's a huge amount of overlap between these two business units. And having those synergies allows both for more distributed use of resources to apply to both of them. And it also helps us uh, in our go-to market plan. The recycling system will be first to market. It can be established in a matter of quarters, whereas the primary metal business takes several years for any type of product to actually get to market. But then once the primary metal actually gets to market, it can be much larger scale and not be limited by the type of feed coming back from the market with the recycling system. So we see these two business units as very complementary, and we're happy to have them both move forward together. So we are building this first pre-commercial facility in Northern Nevada. This has both the battery recycling operations, as well as our global development center, where we will be actually developing second generation technologies, both for our recycling plant and for our primary metals business. We've built in three different scales of laboratories into this development center, our own analytical laboratory to perform our own quality assessments for our product and intermediate materials, a processing lab where we will be developing new components 
and then a piloting bay to actually prove these components out at much larger scale before implementing them into the pre-commercial battery recycling facility. So we have a great team to be able to bring on here. You know, we, we purchased a, a, a greenfield site in Northern Nevada where we have an empty piece of land and are going all the way from this empty piece of land to a functioning facility. So we needed a wide set of skills to make this happen. So myself, much of my background is in you know, chemical mechanical engineering and really the scale up of these first of kind processes, how we go through initial design to bench validation, to piloting to commercial units. You know, August May and I have worked together for over 10 years now. You know, one of my lead chemical engineers when I worked at Tesla, he's helped develop many of these different primary metal and battery recycling technologies at the laboratory and bench scales. And then in, in previous days, when August and I would develop new technologies, we would go through our own bench validations and piloting. And then at Gigafactory, when we wanted to build a commercial scale unit based on those technologies we developed, Chuck Leber was the construction manager at Gigafactory. We would go to him to actually help purchase and install and commission these very large commercial systems at the Gigafactory based off of the R&D level systems that August and I developed. Chris Gustafson was our lead procurement manager back at Gigafactory. He would help you know, specify and bid and contract and purchase all those large scale components. You know, Andre spent about four years at McKinsey as a consultant and then four years at Apple, really helping getting their, their Asian manufacturing facilities constructed and commissioned and then streamlined going forward. And then we've just brought over you know, one of my lead analytical chemists from back at Gigafactory, where even developing the procedures and methods to measure the very low types of impurities in these metal products is not trivial. So having somebody who has gone through this before is extremely meaningful. So this team together and many others that we have, have the skill set to go from an empty piece of greenfield land in Northern Nevada, all the way to a functioning facility with battery cap of material grade coming out the back end. As far as our throughput, this first pre-commercial facility will have about a 20,000 ton per year throughput as mentioned. And then we'll be ramping up subsequent commercial scale facilities afterwards that are in order of magnitude larger throughput. You know, we have the great team here that we've put together that really helps us execute on these systems. And then just in, in summary here, you know, these are the real attributes that we think are important about what differentiates from the companies out there and about how we will take the next steps to go from being an exploratory and development company to actually being a manufacturing and operations company with real product out the door. So that's the end of our, our discussion here. And I think we can take some questions from the group. That's um, great. Thank you so much, Ryan, for that overview. We have a number of questions coming through. Um, let's see how many we can do. Um, question on the construction permit. Um, when is it expected to be issued? Um, and how does the company plan to finance the construction and equipment purchases to get the pilot plant up and running? So we've received several permits already from the, the city, the state and the federal level. There's one remaining to start construction of the physical building itself. We expect to hear back on that any day now from the city, which will then allow us to actually move forward with our, our on-site construction work. As far as the financing, we have uh, the initial amounts of capital needed to start the process. And we're evaluating several offers now about how to finance the remainder of the operations. Okay. Um, with the pilot plant expected to be operational mid-year 22, um, will that include the lithium recycling or just the outer casing, the plastic, et cetera, which is loop one in the process? We'll initially have loop run running. That's what we'll start mid next year. And then we'll subsequently be adding each individual unit operation as we move forward. Great. Um, any news or information that you can share on how the USCAR grant talks are going? Have you had any news on that front? So we mentioned we submitted the application to that program quite a while ago, and we'll be able to make a public announce that 
once um, it's approved by all the organizations involved in that proposal. So we, we expect to be able to do that very soon. Great. Um, another one, any plans to target your extraction technology towards the North America manganese supply? We produce manganese through our recycling operations, but at the moment we don't plan on targeting it for our primary battery metal system. It's the, the lithium, the nickel, cobalt we're focusing on in the near term for the primary metals business. Okay, great. Then another question here, um, does the NASA withdrawal of 23,000 acres in Railroad Valley, which prohibits mining for 20 years, affect any of the company's mining claims? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that's referring to, but in, in general, we are moving forward with development level work, you know, at each of our facilities in Central Nevada that are lithium bearing. Our demonstration through the grant program is actually a bit west, you know, closer to Tonopah and outside of that railroad valley area. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, question regarding the sites that you're targeting for your commercial plan. The understanding was that it was going to be 200,000 tons. Didn't change recently to 100,000. And is there a reason for that, if that's the case? We've always said that the commercial plants will be an order of magnitude larger than the uh, pre-commercial facility. But as we go into commercial plants, it is very unlikely that we will build them as standalone facilities. Because of this closed loop nature, you know, we will be co-locating these types of plants with companies on the upstream side, you know, points of collection for battery materials, and with the downstream side with companies actually synthesizing active cathode material. So as these aren't standalone operations, we'll intentionally be sizing the throughput of these commercial facilities with the companies we're co-locating with. So that type of throughput for commercial plants will be decided upon based on who we're co-locating with at that time. Understood. Um, question on uh, your extraction, placed on the extraction process. How does it uh, differ from American Lithium's in-house placed on extraction process? I mean, American Lithium has you know, publicly stated some details about their processes. What we do is really much more of a selective extraction not a broad spectrum extraction. And what that really does is allow us to target specifically liberating the lithium from this type of sedimentary resource host structure, as opposed to dissolving the whole structure itself. So we're, we're going through this demonstration program now to prove that that works beyond just the bench scale, but also works at the multi-ton per day demonstration scale. Got it. Uh, let's see. Um, how is investment in sales and Salesforce going? Can you discuss any initial conversations you have with potential partners? And if I may add to that, I think in August, um, there was some commentary made about an announcement from a consortium of automakers. Um, any updates on that? So working with prospective partners, both upstream on the OEM side and downstream on more of the cathode company side, you know, they're, they're proceeding very well. Obviously, to announce those types of agreements, you need, you know, broad spectrum approval from every company involved in those types of agreements. So we'll, we'll be making those announcements as those groups of companies uh, approve them. Got it. Um, okay, there's so many um, questions coming through. Um, isn't Biden pro-lithium import um, and doesn't he want to concentrate on recycling? Where does that leave? ABML uh, in that regard. So the Biden administration, you know, directly through the White House, through their executive orders, also through Department of Energy and through EPA that we've been speaking with, this is one of their highest priorities. And this is why it's, you know, great. Like mentioned, I'm, I'm part of the technical advisory board for the U.S. Department of Energy's Critical Materials Institute. So there's large amounts of interest from the federal government, both through increased grants for R&D level and specifically for assistance in commercializing and scaling up these type of operations domestically. So we're very excited about the level of support that we have to help move forward. 
from the federal government in every way. Maybe I'll squeeze a last one here. How much in financing do you need to raise before you reach cash flow, sorry, cash flow break even? So cash flow break, break even is really about having just the first part of our facility operational, which is what we're talking about for mid next year. So just that, that first loop of operations is really what we need to be self-sustaining as a company. So based on what we have you know, currently today and what we're evaluating offers for now to move forward with, you know, we're confident we'll be able to make that happen relatively soon. And then that will essentially provide us all the resources that we need in order to build just the first part of this facility, which will make us financially self-sustaining and independent going forward. Great. So um, I think that's all the time we had today. Ryan, would you like to make any closing comments? Just to state that we're excited to move forward from being, again, an exploratory and a development level company to now becoming a manufacturing and operations-based company. Now it requires a different set of skills, different personnel, different mindset as we move forward. And that's the most exciting transition that we're looking to make. And it's happening extremely soon as we move forward with the construction of the plant, the installation commissioning of each of our operations, and then moving towards true uh, commercial scale manufacturing relatively soon. So we're excited to make that transition and to keep everybody here up to date on how we move forward with that. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for a great presentation and answers to questions. And thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. That concludes today's uh, webcast. Thank you.